Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. So now that Jeff Bezos has essentially bludgeoned his way into an HLS contract, what are we getting for our money? Well, we finally got an opportunity to see what's called a low-def mock-up of the Blue Moon Lander, although this isn't the final version. This is just the cargo version of the Blue Moon Lander, also known as Mark 1, and we're going to be seeing, at least presumably, the Mark 2 version sometime in the near future. And let me tell you something. Something. Not only is this thing significantly flawed, it might sabotage Artemis for good. All of this and more coming at you on the Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Before I get going, I just wanted to thank the 23 people who have signed up for Patreon this month. Thank you so much for putting in that added support to this channel that's going to make it possible for me to go to some of these amazing launches that are coming up, both Vulcan Centaur and hopefully OFT2 for Starship here in the very near future. Again, if you would like to support my efforts to do that, all the details are in the description. Okay, that's enough talking about that. Let's talk about why I'm not wearing sunglasses. Over the course of the next week or so, I'm going to be releasing a series of three videos about why Artemis is so significantly flawed, aside from the problems with SLS, because obviously we know that SLS is too expensive to really carry on a sustained campaign campaign of establishing a permanent presence on the moon, but there's a lot of other problems besides that. And the first of these problems that we're going to be talking about is the Blue Origin Lander. And if I came to you wearing sunglasses, many people, perhaps first-time viewers of this channel, would say, this guy's a freak. He doesn't know what he's talking about. These are professional engineers who came up with this idea. What does he know, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Well, the conclusions that I come to in this video are not based based exclusively on my own opinions at all, but rather the opinions of people who are heavily engaged in the space industry, including people like Tori Bruno. Really, there are so many serious problems with this lander. It shocks me that NASA selected it in the first place when they had such a better alternative. Now, I'm not saying that Blue Moon is a piece of junk that, you know, will never be able to do anything on the moon. I do believe that it is a very good idea for a heavy lift lander that might be able to sustain a permanent presence on the moon in the long run, assuming, of course, that you had a base established there and, more importantly, a landing pad on the surface of the moon. But if you don't have those things, if this is the early stage of lunar exploration, this thing sucks. Now let's start off with the high points, or the kinda high points, because admittedly, the BE-7 engine for this lander is a pretty good idea, because it runs off of hydrogen and oxygen. Now granted, hydrogen is a bear to work with because it operates at such low temperatures, or at least when it's in liquid form, and it's very difficult to keep this stuff from bleeding off out in a microgravity vacuum environment. However, that being the case, there is abundant hydrogen available on the moon, at least we think so, because of the abundant water ice at the lunar south pole. Indeed, this made Blue Moon the best option of all three HLS candidates, because the other two run off of methalox, and there is almost no methane on the moon. In fact, there may be none at all, and also the moon is not very rich in carbon, so you can't make methane utilizing the saboteur method. Now, there might be some carbon somewhere on the moon, but for the most part, the BE-7 is the best choice for taking advantage of in situ resource utilization on the moon, which is really important if you want to set up a sustained presence there. However, on the negative side, Blue Origin is nowhere near to getting this engine to a mature enough level to be able to perform on the moon, and we know how long it takes Blue Origin to develop new engines 
even when the pressure is on in a big way. So that could be a serious issue. On the other side of the equation though, it only has about 10,000 pounds worth of thrust, which makes it a lot better for setting down on the moon without creating a maelstrom of rocks and regolith in the process. So kind of a positive and negative thing with the BE-7, but that's kind of where the advantages come to an end. Well, not entirely, because it is reusable. I mean, let's go ahead and talk about a few high points while we're at it. But speaking of high points, look at the old concept for the Blue Moon Lander. See a difference there? It's a lot more squat. And that is a huge factor. The low def mock up that we've already seen is about 9 meters tall. However, the final crude version is going to be 16 meters tall, the height of a five story building. Now, obviously, this problem becomes significantly worse with Starship, but still, this thing is tall and ungainly, especially if it's setting down on an uneven surface that you don't know how solid or resilient it is, especially if you're putting something pretty heavy down on it. By way of comparison, the Apollo LEM was 9 meters in diameter as far as the landing gear span was concerned and under 5.5 meters tall. In other words, you had a landing gear span that was substantially larger than the height of the vehicle, which is a damn good idea if you're not setting down on a solid landing pad. Incredibly, the low def mock-up that we've seen thus far actually has a landing gear that is smaller than the Apollo LEM, even though the actual vehicle is many times larger. This just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Now, of course, they can probably make some modifications to the landing gear to make the whole thing a lot more squat, but it doesn't give me a whole lot of confidence to see the first thing Blue Origin rolls out as being simply unstable and unsafe. And it gets even worse than that. In order to get away from the original problem that Blue Origin had with putting the crew cabin way, way up off the ground where it was almost impossible to get to, the new updated version has the crew cabin down on the ground. Well, that's a pretty good idea. It makes it easily accessible. However, the vast majority of the mass, that is to say propellant, cargo, everything else, is above the astronauts' heads which means this thing is dangerously top-heavy on top of everything else. But that's just for starters. There are far more fundamental problems with this thing as far as its design is concerned. First of all, I don't see how they're going to be able to get this massive thing out to the moon in the first place. The current configuration calls for three New Glenn launches, one to deploy the lander, and two to deploy two different components of a as yet unseen refueling vehicle that will provide Blue Moon with all of the propellant and oxidizer that it needs to land on the moon and then return to the lunar gateway to return the asteroid astronauts to safety. But about a year ago, Tori Bruno told his employees that New Glenn, without a third stage, is going to have a hard time delivering anything beyond low Earth orbit because the upper stage is powered only by BE-3U engines, which is fine. They have a fair amount of thrust, but the first stage is only powered by seven BE-4 engines. Now, that may sound like a hell of a lot, but it's actually less than four. 4 million pounds of thrust, or less thrust than a Vulcan Centaur with six solid rocket boosters. And New Glenn is way bigger and way heavier than Vulcan Centaur. And you see how their payload capabilities tend to drop off dramatically once you get beyond low Earth orbit. Yeah, technically it's 40 metric tons to low Earth orbit, but it drops to 13 metric tons to geosynchronous transfer orbit. Vulcan Centaur with six solid rocket boosters anyway, can deliver 14 and a half metric tons to GTO. And so presumably a lot more mass out to translunar injection orbit as well. Now it's very interesting that ULA publicizes the payload capabilities for Vulcan out to TLI, 11 and a half metric tons. However, Blue Origin does not. My guess would be that it's 10 metric tons at best, and it may even be less than that. 
which is probably one of the reasons why this thing requires so much refueling in cislunar space, because it probably has to burn every drop of fuel it has available in order to get to the moon in the first place, because New Glenn can't get it there on its own. And so here's what I find to be so ridiculous about this entire plan. You have one launch of SLS to get the astronauts out to the Lunar Gateway in the first place, and then three launches of New Glenn to put four astronauts down on the surface of the moon. One launch of a huge rocket for every astronaut. Does that sound efficient to you? No, not to me either. Although the problem gets a hell of a lot worse with Starship, but we're not going to talk about that in this particular video. Now, it might sound like that I'm arguing against the concept of low Earth orbit refueling and reusability. Well, no, not at all. I believe that this is the only way that we're going to be able to colonize the solar system. However, for the needs that Artemis spells out, and by the way, for all the future planned Artemis missions, all the way out until 2040, the maximum number of astronauts that are included in any given mission is four astronauts astronauts. So why do you need such colossal vehicles to carry out these types of missions? It's just mismatched. But this story gets worse the deeper you read into it. You see, another thing about the sustainable HLS program is it was billed as an alternative to the original HLS contract. That is to say, if something went wrong with Starship, NASA would have a fallback. And this was something they always wanted and simply weren't able to do it with the original contract because Congress didn't give them enough money. However, having an alternative to Starship is a very good idea. We really don't know with any degree of confidence as to how long it's going to take that architecture to be ready to go to the moon. Once again, I'll talk about that in a future video. However, now we have a replacement that's even worse. We have a low def mock-up that's coming only in 2023 and at the end of 2023 at that. By way of comparison, the Dynetics Alpha Alpaca had their low def mock up by 2020, three years ago, which means that Blue Origin is already three years behind Alpaca's development path. Which means, how long is it really going to take to have this whole damn thing ready to go? Eight years? Ten years? Twelve? I think minimum. 10 years, which means 2033 would be the earliest we could hope to have a replacement for Starship or an alternative if there proves to be significant problems in getting Lunar Starship to the moon. That is simply unacceptable. And once again, I don't think 10 years is an unreasonable estimate at all. We don't even have a low def mock up for the full human rated vehicle yet. We need to carry out a number of successful tests with the Mark 1 cargo version of this ship before we can even move on to the Mark 2. But just to give you an idea of how delusional Blue Origin's timetable is on all of this, they plan to have two two unmanned landings of the Mark 1, of course it's a cargo vessel, so unmanned by definition, in 2026, with the first unmanned mission of the Mark II in 2027, which means in theory, the human rated version of this ship should be ready to go by 2028. And if you believe that, well, I have some property to sell you on the moon and also on Titan and Pluto while we're at it. So what really is the reason that NASA went with this thing? I mean, once again, I think it's a good solution for a long-term presence on the moon in the distant future when you need to carry larger numbers of passengers, large amounts of cargo, that sort of thing. But it just isn't the best solution for the early Artemis mission. In other words, every Artemis mission that is currently planned. Now, I'm sorry for beating a dead horse, but let's have a look at the alpaca again. 
It's low slung to the ground, which means it's very stable. And that's something that's extremely important at the lunar south pole. The terrain is very, very difficult to work in down there. Much more challenging than any Apollo landing site. And by the way, NASA only has a 100 meter accuracy requirement for any of these landers. So if they pick a landing spot, they only need to get within about 100 meters of the selected location. How do you know there isn't going to be uneven terrain or a rock or something like that that's going to topple your really tall, top-heavy lander over? Alpaca is set up to land on extremely steep slopes far steeper than anything that the alternatives could land on. In addition, it's small, in other words, designed for four people, not for a hundred, and its relatively small size gives it an advantage in terms of architecture as well. The Alpaca can fit inside the universal stage adapter of the SLS Block 1B, which means all you need is a single refueling tanker to fuel it up in cislunar space and then send it down one lander, one launch required, in addition to SLS, of course, but that launch is required no matter what you do. So safer, simpler, more mature in its development, so why the hell did NASA go with Blue Origin? Well, number one, price. Jeff Bezos threw a ton of his own money at the project, which is something Dynetics could not do, and so therefore essentially bought himself a customer. But there's another very significant reason that can be borne out by a public statement that NASA made during all the unpleasantness during the GAO complaint, or the legal battle, shall we say, with Blue Origin and the GAO. Quote, It is not an overstatement to say that all of the successes upon which the option a procurement is built, all of this once-in-a-generation momentum can easily be undone by one party, in this case Blue Origin, who seeks to prioritize its own fortunes over that of NASA, the United States, and every person alive today who dreams to see humans exploring worlds beyond our own. Plainly stated, a protest sustained in the instant dispute runs the high risk of creating not just delays for the Artemis program, but that it will never actually achieve its goal of returning the United States to the moon. Now, it may seem strange that NASA decided to do business with a company that they felt like this about not that long ago, but the reason is pretty damned obvious. They didn't want to get sued again. They didn't want the process to get held up for another six months to a year, or possibly even longer if appeals had been made. By way of comparison, they knew that Dynetics was not going to challenge this issue again with the GAO or in the courts. Consequently, NASA was allowed to move forward more quickly simply because they chose the company that wasn't going to make a huge fuss, which is the wrong reason to do business with someone. So where are we right now? Well, Starship seems to be NASA's best and only solution to put human beings on the moon in anything resembling the near future. The Blue Origin solution, which may be good in the long run, is going to take entirely too long to develop and is completely inappropriate for these early Artemis missions anyway. And if Starship doesn't succeed, China's more straightforward solution of one launch, one landing will almost certainly get to the moon first and Artemis will be dead before it even gets started. Please stay tuned for part two of this series where I'm going to be talking about Lunar Starship and all the strengths and weaknesses of Elon's super rocket and continue our conversation as to why Artemis is such a flawed plan on so many levels. And hopefully we might be able to fix it before it gets shut down. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe, and please check the description for various ways to support this content and as always, stay angry about space.